So if you've been in a relationship of any sort, then you know in any relationship we have a saver and a spender. So if you've been part of our um, series, the, the stewardship one, you know that within the context of our marriage, I'm the saver and Paul is the spender. And so all this means is that he loves to spend money on the latest gadgets, the, the latest iPhones. So a good chunk of our week involves him coming to me with a request or something to purchase and me having to tell him, ah, not quite yet. It's not worth it, babe. So it's not that I don't spend money, okay? The extent of my spending happens in the fruit and vegetable aisles of the farmer's market. I'm so ashamed to even admit it, but for some reason, I stepped foot in that place, and it has me in a chokehold. The day I step foot in there, I always tell myself, this is the day you start your health journey. So you must go through these aisles and buy all the fruit and all vegetables you can find. So I obey. I go ahead, I buy all the fruit and all the veggies that I can find. And I'll get home with bags and bags of fruit and veggies and Paul will just roll his eyes. Because he knows in about a week or two what's going to happen with it. That's right, it's gonna go bad, because we don't eat it. It's going to go bad within a week or so before we even had a chance to consume them all. And so that's the extent of my spending and my waste of money. There you have it. And now you know all our secrets. <laughs> I wanna bring you into, it's closing day of our current house. It's closing day, and this man, your pastor, comes to me on closing day wanting to purchase a piano, y'all. He's not requesting to purchase any piano. He's asking to purchase a baby grand piano. Mind you, I'm telling you, it's closing day, right? Anyone here familiar with the cost of a baby grand piano? Amen? All right. So my very first thought was, well, I, I probably verbalized it. I said, are you out of your God-loving mind? Are you out of your mind? It is closing day. Here's the thing about Paul. I always know when he's serious about spending. I always know when he's associated great worth to something he's purchased versus when he's trying to push the limits on where I'll cave in. When he truly wants something, when he's associated worth to something, he'll come with his spreadsheet, with the numbers, with the research. So he did that. He, I know that he knows that I'm a saver, I'm not a spender. Not only that, this man is a realtor, so he knows the complexities around closing day. So none of this is a surprise to him at all. So I listened, and so he went through the whole scenario, and he said, a baby grand piano costs this. When I researched, I found out that people who are selling baby grants out there are requesting this. These sellers are asking for this. The, the savers in the room, you also know that we love to save. We love a good deal. And so I'm looking at the numbers, I'm like, oh, it costs this? this uh, oh, they're asking for this? Huh, that is an amazing deal. So I caved in, y'all. We ended up purchasing this baby grand piano for a fraction of its worth. A fraction of its worth. So two years in, this piano is still worth way more than the cost we paid for it. And so I want you to know, just because we did not purchase it at its original price doesn't mean that it did not cost us, that it did not come as a sacrifice for us. Okay, so here's the first thing I want you to understand for our time today. Worship comes at a cost. Now, over the past few weeks, we've been in our series, Shaped by Love, learning about all aspects of worship. And I want us to focus on the fact that the price we're willing to pay is determined by how much it will benefit us. It's determined by how much worth we have associated to a thing, okay? So this is a story in the Bible about the people of Israel. And so the people of Israel had sinned against God and God was extremely 
angry with them. Their king at the time was King David. So God went to King David. He said, you have the choice of three punishments. So David said, give me the plague, Lord. I'll take the plague for 500. So the plague comes and 70,000 lives are perished. 70,000 people died, and David was broken by this sin. And so he wanted to take responsibility for this wrongdoing. So what David did, he decided to do an altar call, and he decided to offer burnt offering onto the Lord. So David went to this guy named Aruna. He went to him wanting to purchase a threshing floor. If you guys are not familiar with a threshing floor, it's what you use as the foundation of an altar for a burnt offering. So to David's surprise, Arona said, not only will I provide this threshing floor for free, I will also give you everything else you need for this burnt offering for free. And here's what's profound about David's response. David said to him, no. I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. So David refused to offer anything to God that he did not pay for, that did not come to him as a cost. So when you realize just who God is, and how much he is worth, offering him cheap worship is an insult. You'll probably hear, Jenny, what is cheap worship? Cheap worship is a mindset. Cheap worship is a mindset that says, I can only worship when I feel like it, as if we're not worshiping a resurrected king. Cheap worship says, I can only worship when my favorite song is being sung. Cheap worship says, I can only worship when the accounts look right, when everything is just flowing right. That is cheap worship. So to set up our conversation today, I'm going to give you three things that worship will cost you. You ready? So the first one is that worship will cost you your time. So there's this guy named Abraham. Abraham is married to Sarah. So God tells Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. The facts before Abraham is that his wife Sarah is actually barren. So she's unable to have children. And then it takes them 25 years for this promise to finally be realized. And if you've been here for some time, you've probably heard Paul share our journey of infertility. Me too, just like Abraham, we thought, we knew that my womb would bear fruit. We knew that God was going to make a way. So it took us seven years, seven years of waiting, money spent on specialists, money spent on doctors. It took us seven years. Okay? Now, your time in waiting is just as important. What you do while you wait is just as important. And so during that time for Abraham, God actually changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And Abraham means father of multitudes. So for 25 years, until this promise was even realized, anytime anyone even said hello to Abraham, they were literally saying, hello, father of multitudes. They were literally speaking out the promise that God had laid on his heart for 25 years. So what you do in your time of waiting is extremely important. For me in my season of waiting, what helped me was what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 5.3. He says, when we run into problems and trials, we know this will help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength and character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And here's my favorite part, y'all. It says, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. And so the time we spend in waiting can only benefit us. The time we spend in waiting could never disappoint us. Have you ever heard anyone say, I waited on God for said amount of years. I waited on God for said amount of time and he disappointed me. You won't. It does not exist. Okay? So for me, it took seven years. For Abraham, it took 25. So yes, worship 
will cost you your time. Here's the second thing that worship will cost you. Worship will cost you your treasure. It will cost you your treasure. There's this thing in theology known as the principle of first mention. And the principle of first mention says this. It says if you're looking to truly define a biblical term, then you must go to the place in scripture where this term was first mentioned. And that is the place where you'll most likely find the purest and most authentic definition of this term. Okay? The principle of first mention. And so we're talking about worship. Now, worship was first mentioned in Genesis 22. So fast forward to 25 years, and finally, Abraham gets his promise. Isaac is here. Okay? And in a short time later, God is like, Abraham, now you must let go of this promise. Now you must sacrifice your son. Imagine waiting for 25 years, praying, begging God for a promise. It's in your hands. It's tangible. And God is like, now you must let it go. Okay? God asked him to sacrifice Isaac. So let's go to Genesis 22 and read it. God says to him, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, the very next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for the burnt offering and set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. Stay here with the donkey, he said to his, ser to his servants. The boy and I will travel farther. We will worship there, and then we will return. So worship was first mentioned in the Bible when Abraham told his servants that him and Isaac were going up to the mountain to worship. Though out of his mouth he said the word worship, in his heart Abraham knew he was going there to sacrifice. He knew he was going there to let go and lay out the life, lay down the life of his one and only son. In the original language, worship means to bow down, to surrender. The boy and I are going up to the mountain to bow down. The boy and I are going up to the mountain to surrender. The boy and I are going up to the mountain to sacrifice. That's at the heart of worship. It is surrender. Nowadays, worship, worship is about giving God what feels good, it's about giving God what sounds good. It's about giving God what looks good. Now, what does it mean to worship God anyway? The idea of worshiping through heartbreak, through pain, through uncertainty is almost non-existent these days. This idea is very real in my life. So biblically speaking, worship, when it was highlighted in the Old Testament, it meant sacrifice. A couple of years into our marriage, the idea of motherhood had become an idol in my life. You know, Paul and I were very careful at saying God, God told me so. It's not that we don't believe that God speaks. God absolutely speaks. We believe in it so much so that it is so sacred, that it is so divine, that we don't use it loosely. But a couple of years in, we truly felt God telling me, Jenny, if I don't show up, will you still love me? If you never become a mother, what then happens to a relationship? Could you still live a life of following me if you never become a mother? You see, we're, the, the idea of becoming a mother had become my idol. I was so focused on the promise that I lost track of the giver of all promises. I lost track of my true intimacy with God. I lost track of my relationship with him. So I got on a journey of reigniting my, my faith in the intimacy, in the relationship that I have with God. It will and should cost you what you treasure most. 
For Abraham, the idea of having a son had become so much of an idol for them that they took matters into their own hands and he slept with his servant. It became an idol in his life. You know when something has become an idol in your life, when you feel like you must help God out. Not us mere humans helping and stepping in. Lord, let me assist you in this. You must not know as the creator of the universe. You must not know what you're doing. Let me help you. That's when you know the promise has become an idol in your life. Worship will cost you the thing you hold most dear. It is a sacrifice. So worship will cost you your time. Worship will cost you your treasure. And now here's this. Worship will cost you your comfort. God will bring you to the edge of yourself just to test your faith. Abraham's story goes on to say, Just as he was getting ready to kill and sacrifice Isaac, he looked up, there was a ram. There was an answer. God provided a way out. Now, here's the sweet part about God's character here. Abraham did not know that God was going to provide a way out. He did not know that God was going to provide a ram. What did he know? He knew his God. He knew the character of his God, and that was enough for him. Some of us here, we want to know the details of how something will turn out before we can obey. We want to know what the end looks like, Lord, because before I take the first step, I got to know. True faith is realized when we go when he says go. True faith is activated when we just take that leap, when we just take that first step. Abraham knew the character of his God, which was enough for him. You see, when you spend time in worship with God, he starts to reveal aspects of his character to you. And with that knowledge, you take that knowledge and you store it in your repository for a time you will, when you need it most. And you will. There will be times in your life where you will be tested, where problems will arise, where trials will come, and you'll have to know, take things out of your repository and say, God is faithful. God is healer. God is provider. you got to know. So after seven years of waiting, a baby girl, Gia, is finally here. July of 2022. Y'all, there were so many complications in that delivery room. I'll spare you the details. Whenever you're watching a show or a movie and you see that they deploy anybody who's anybody into a delivery room, you know what? What do you know? What does it mean? Something is seriously wrong. And that was the case for me, y'all. I must have had about 20 doctors and nurses in my delivery room. After some time, Gia finally comes out. She lets out one cry. Cord is wrapped around her neck, and she turned blue. My baby girl stopped breathing. She stopped breathing. Seven years of waiting, seven years of praying. She is here for nothing but a second, then stops to breathe. At this point, Paul is speaking in tongues. Mom is praying. Even the doctor is praying, y'all. After some time, they did their thing. By the grace of God, she came back. To my left, I heard mom say, thank you, Jesus. The doctor says, thank Jesus is right. This was nothing but God. As I watched the worry and fear on everyone's face, I said to myself, me and my baby are going to walk out of here alive and well. Me and my baby will walk out of here 
alive and well. I don't care what you all think, we're going to walk out of here alive and well because I know the character of my God. And in his character, it tells me that he would never bring me here and have this be my story. In his character, it tells me that he would never bring me here and just take my baby. In his character, it tells me that he would just never leave me nor forsake me. Well, let me tell you something. In my season of waiting, that was when I learned the true character of God. In my season of waiting, that's when I truly learned who God was. Through those years of worshiping, in spite of what he could give me, in spite of what he could do for me, in that season, I learned about his character. So there may be occasions when the decisions to follow Jesus will cost you your personal comfort. Now, can you trust God without knowing what's going to happen at the end of the tunnel? Can you truly trust him? So worship will cost you your time. Worship will cost you your treasure. And worship will cost you your comfort. So now what do we do with this? I want us to do what James says. And he says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. What is James saying here? James is saying you may not always feel like it. James is saying things in your life may not be working out as you want them to work out. But still, still, Jesus is deserving of everything that we have. All worship is not contingent upon how we're feeling. It's not contingent upon the seasons that we're in. And if it is, you need to elevate your view of God. If it is, your view of God is almost non-existent or it is way too low. You must elevate your view of God. His worth is unchanging. It's not like us. It's not like the seasons. It is unchanging. And I know this may be difficult. And for some, it may feel like I'm asking you to ignore your present reality. Let me assure you, you are not. Worship is not about ignoring your problems. Worship is about choosing to focus on the solution. God's worth is most accurately expressed in worship when the price we pay is a bit too costly. That's when true faith is activated. If you were here last week, you probably like, can we go back to us learning about how to express ourselves in worship? Can, you, can we go back to learning about how to dance like David danced, how to shout, how to sing, how to do all of these things? Can we go back to that? Expressing ourselves in worship is fine. There is nothing wrong with that. But I'm here to tell you that we are not to only worship, we are not to only dance in certain seasons, okay? Understanding that at your core, at your core, worship is costly. At your core, worship is sacrifice. Then you will learn to not only worship in seasons when things are going right. You will learn that when things go wrong, you worship anyway. As you know, the fruit and veggie thing isn't working out for me. So now I'm learning about gut health. Pray for your pastor. We're learning about gut health. And in gut health, it says that if you can get your gut strong, then everything else in health will fall into place. We'll see. I'll let you guys know in a couple weeks how it's working out for me. So I want at your core that you are strong. I want this for you so that if you ever find your, yourself in a room with doctors and they're telling you that something is impossible for you, that you look at them and you say, not to my God. I want you, if you ever get to a place and you're literally in a delivery room bleeding to death, your baby comes out not breathing, and you're not questioning the character of God. I want you, if you ever, God forbid, find yourself in a, in a near fatal car crash. You go blind out of one eye, broken bones, fractured pieces everywhere, everywhere. Everything is broken. That you not turn your back on your God. That's what I want for you. You need a strong core so that you not waver at your core when problems and trouble come your way. If you don't know the story, about a month before we launched Hope X Church, 
I was in a near fatal car crash. Driver yield, he, he failed to yield, ran a light through my car on the other side of the road. Instantly, I went blind out of my left eye, instantly. They say that the punch I got to my face was almost like getting punched by Mike Tyson twice, twice. Fractured bones, nose is broken. I showed up the next week to see a facial surgeon. He says, I see here in your chart that you had, had, keyword had, a broken nose and fractured bones. But all my tests, I'm seeing that your nose and all the bones are miraculously falling back into place on their own. <laughs> on their own. The thing is, when you live a life surrendered to God, he will come through. He will show up every single time. After the accident, Paul came to me. He said, let's push back the launch. Let's focus on you healing up and push back the launch. I said, no. Mm -mm. I know the tactics by now. I know them by now. We press on. We march on. And we're going to launch this church. And so we did. We launched this church. Months later, my eye is restored. I'm fully healed. People look at me. They can't even tell that I was in this car accident. He will come through. So allowing worship to cost you your time, allowing worship to cost you what you treasure most, allowing worship to cost you your personal comfort leads to a life surrendered as worship. And that's the point today. A life surrendered as worship is the greatest worship you could give to God. A life surrendered as worship says, God, here I am. Do with me as you please. There is nothing that God won't do with a life that is truly surrendered. Yes, we can learn about all these things, but when your life is truly surrendered as worship onto God, he will blow your mind. He will blow your mind, okay? In seasons when things are tough, you say, God, I worship, and I worship you anyway. Not because of what's in your hand, but because of your goodness, but because of who you are. And here's the last point I want you to see. Nothing we'll give to God could ever be considered too much. I love what the prophet Habakkuk says. He says, though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no good, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. You see, just like my journey, Habakkuk knew the facts existent in his reality, yet with unrelenting worship as his response. The amazing thing about God is this, our lack of commitment doesn't nullify his faithfulness. Even while we struggle to fully commit to him and giving him worship, he deserves it anyway because he is good, y'all. He is good. Not at our own expense, but at the high cost of a perfect sacrifice. This is Greek word, gnosko. Gnosko simply means experiential knowledge. Gnosko says, I've experienced this and I know. So when we stand before you, we can and week out encouraging you telling you about God's faithfulness telling you about God's goodness telling you that God is provider it's because we go no school it's because we go no school God as a healer it's because we go no school God's faithfulness it's because we have experiential knowledge that he is a provider Without going through those hard seasons, you don't get to gnosko. Without going through those hard times, you don't get to experience his true knowledge. You don't get that. It's not 
at our own expense. It's at the high cost of a perfect sacrifice. Jesus paid a price we could not pay, y'all, for a debt he did not owe to give us a life we don't deserve. So no matter how high the cost of worship may be, it could never be too much. There's nothing we could ever give God and we look back and say, this cost me way too much. No, it's never too much.